right. Well, ooh, ooh. well, good evening, everybody. It's wonderful to see so many people here. Thank you all for coming on this rather warm uh, evening. Uh, so um, I've just published another book. It's called Hitler's People, The Faces of the Third Reich. And I'll talk about it for about a quarter of an hour, and then I'll face questions from... Uh, from everybody here. So why did I write this book? Why am I, why did I become interested in modern German history? Well, I am, as you may see from my graying hair, a baby boomer. So uh, I was born after the war, a couple of years after the war ended. And my parents were Welsh. In fact, they learnt English as a foreign language in, in Welsh schools and then moved to London separately because there were no jobs in their 30s. Uh, and we lived on the fringes of the East End, so we went into Leytonstone, Hackney, Walthamstow, and so on quite frequently. And I was astonished as a child in the 50s and early 60s to see all the bomb sites, the kind of rows of terraced houses with sudden gaps in them, like missing, missing teeth in someone's mouth. And on the top floors, very shockingly, and I remember vividly, there, were, there was the wallpaper, strangely intimate, the bedroom wallpaper. The debris had all been cleared away, but, but, but there were the gaps, the evidence of bomb damage. And so, of course, I asked as a child, well, who did this? Why did they do this? And, of course, the answer was, well, the Germans did it, the Nazis did it. And that then stayed in my mind. And when I got to, I'm sorry to say, Oxford, uh, as an undergraduate, uh, in the late, mid to late 1960s, German history and German historians are just waking up after two decades of amnesia where they're trying to forget the war and we're just starting serious work. And it was a fantastically exciting time to be a historian working, and so I was drawn into working on modern Germany. And it was also a time when social history with the great British Marxist historians, Eric Hobsbawm, Edward Thompson, uh, and, and all the rest of them were producing their work, having left either really or in, in spirit left the Communist Party. So uh, there were new methods that were available, new perspectives, and so I did my doctorate on German history, long-term origins of Nazism, which was a big topic in those, in those days. Uh, and so, of course, when I got a job, uh, a university job, it, uh, it was an obvious thing to teach. As so those of you who do history will know that you do the final year as a special subject, which is document-based. And the only modern German history subject where there was enough documentation in English translation was Nazi Germany. So from uh, that time onwards, from the late 1970s, I began teaching that. And so uh, that's how I kept up with scholarship on Nazi Germany. And then towards the end of the 1990s, I was asked to be an expert witness in a court case brought by the writer David Irving against the American historian Deborah Lipstadt, uh, and, who had written a book called um, uh, Denying the Holocaust, The Growing Assault on Truth and Memory. So I'm just making sure this is off. Uh, yeah, The Growing Assault on Truth and Memory. She'd accused him uh, of being a Holocaust denier and a falsifier of history. So he brought a libel suit against her for exemplary damages because... He wasn't a university historian, anything like that. He lived entirely off his publications. So uh, I was asked to be an expert witness. Uh, and if you're an expert witness, you, your duty is to the court. Uh, you have to sign an affidavit saying it doesn't matter who pays you. And you're paid by the hour, uh, so it doesn't matter. I mean, the uh, defence, Lipstadt's defence, could not have turned round had I concluded that Irving was a wonderful historian and didn't tell, didn't tell any lies at all. Um, they'd still have to pay me because it's by the hour anyway. So uh, if you want to know about that uh, trial, there is quite a good movie called a Denial, uh, starring Timothy Spall, Tom Wilkinson and Rachel Weiss, um, uh, which is about the court case. I'm played by an actor who I'm afraid should have lost weight before he went in front of the cameras. Uh, but it's by and large generally quite faithful to the spirit and the letter of the trial. So uh, it's, uh, uh, and that then uh, led me, led the lawyers, the lawyers for the defence, 
including Richard Brampton, to say, could I recommend a good, solid, detailed history of Nazi Germany? And I had to say I couldn't really, because the really good ones like Karl Dietrich Brachers, the German dictatorship, were a bit out of date. They're still worth reading. But on the modern ones, and I won't name any names here, the modern ones were actually not terribly good. So uh, as is the way of things with us historians, I decided to write one myself. And it was going to be one volume, uh, and then it became two and ultimately three. And of course, uh, appeared far too late to be of any use at all for the lawyers who are in, in the trial. Uh, but it was an extraordinary experience, and one of which I'm, uh, I'm really grateful I was allowed to take, take part in. Uh, after that, I, I don't know, I, you know, historians have spent their lives working on the Nazis and the Holocaust. It's not something I could do. I, I, you know, I did those three volumes, and of course, they came out of my teaching of, of Nazi Germany, so I was able to produce them quite quickly. But then I turned to other subjects, in particular, a, history, a history of 19th century Europe in general, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> a rather more cheerful topic, uh, and a couple of um, theoretical works, including one about alternative counterfactual history. And that takes us up to, 19, to uh, 20, 2019, 2018, and I was asked to be a talking head, as the phrase goes, in a uh, TV series called Rise of the Nazis, uh, and it was um, nine parts, and it consisted of a uh, mixture, it's hard not to do this when you're doing a, a topic on recent history, uh, a mixture of archive footage um, and uh, reenactments, which are quite cleverly done, so nobody said anything in the reenactments. And incidentally, they were all filmed in Lithuania because uh, that, because the, it's very cheap to get actors there. Uh, and then um, talking heads like me. And there's a mixture of people like me or Richard Overy or uh, Christian Gershaw and uh, people who were uh, not specialists. So like General Sir Mike Jackson, who you might have noticed just died. He, as it were, represented Hindenburg, both soldiers. Ash Sarkar, who was a self-professed communist, represented Ernst Telma, the communist leader in the Weimar Republic, and so on. Um, and it was incredibly thoroughly prepared. Amazingly impressive. So we had 200-page dossier, each of us, which it wasn't quite scripted, but, I mean, it gave us all the information that we needed. And it focused on individuals. So I, my job, I'm sorry to say, was to represent Hitler. Uh, and it was kind of like... Um, you, you had to say, oh, it's a morning after the Battle of Stalingrad and Hitler's really depressed, you know. Um, you had to speak in the present tense, which for historians is really difficult, you know. You're used to speaking the past tense all the time. But, so they quite often correct me, say, no, 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 to the present tense, please. Uh, and that, but that, what that did is brought me back to thinking about the individuals involved. And because that was the focus. And uh, so I began to think about, well, what about them, you know? And um, some very interesting things had happened since I'd begun writing my three-volume narrative history. One was that biography had become acceptable all the way up to the turn of the century, roughly, um, the, the, the recent century. Uh, biography had been out of fashion because of largely because of the, uh, this is in Germany, among German historians, because of the Nazis' cult of the, the great man, the individual, and so on. Uh, a great German historian uh, wrote a multi-volume history of modern Germany, uh, Hans Ulrich Wehler, even uh, described uh, and condemned biography as personalisierende der Geschichtsschreibung, personalising historical writing. And so you can look through his... Uh, his six volumes, I think, and not really find any people there. It's all big, large-scale forces in history. Uh, and Thomas Nifferdie, who wrote a kind of uh, wonderful three-volume history of 19th century Germany, uh, there's no quotes, no quotations from contemporaries at all. People almost disappear. I did review his three volumes, and I also complained that there weren't any jokes in them, but they didn't go down very well in, in Germany, I'm afraid. Uh, so, uh, so... I thought, well, yes, and then, you know, why not use these new 
biographies, because beginning with Ian Kershaw's wonderful two-volume biography of, of Hitler himself, a whole raft of other biographies of leading Nazis had come out. And also, there were, uh, there's a huge, massive new wave of research on perpetrators uh, at every level, right down to ordinary, ordinary men, as Christopher Browning's book was entitled. So that was a, a major uh, change in things. And then also, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, a huge amount of new material, original material, had come out. A complete set of Goebbels' diaries, Josef Goebbels, the propaganda chief of the Third Reich, had been discovered in an archive in Moscow and were published then in 32 volumes. Uh, imagine that. He was one of these compulsive diarists, you know, like <coughs> Peeps, uh, who just had to write every, every day or every morning. Uh, Goebbels' diaries, the complete set, the, the last volume of the set came out in 2008. Uh, there's a complete set or a complete uh, set of uh, the di Nazi ideologue, Alfred Rosenberg's diaries, came out in 2015. The second volume of Heinrich Himmler's, the head of the SS's, Appointments Diary, which is a fantastically important document, was discovered in an obscure Russian provincial archive and only came out a couple of years ago. So, uh, so there's a vast amount of new material, lots of new biographies, lots of new research. Now, there hadn't actually been a general history of Nazism seen through personalities since the journalist Joachim Fest, also a very fine historian, uh, he had published one called The Face of the Third Reich in 1970. <coughs> so I modelled my book on his, uh, but of course we know now massively more about all these individuals than, uh, than Fest did, and he had a tendency to psychologise, which, which I didn't really follow. Um, so that's my book. My book is subtitled The Faces of the Third Reich, uh, and uh, Hitler's People, meaning Hitler's People, of course, has a number of different different meanings uh, of one sort and another. You can figure that out for your, yourselves. So I divided the book into four parts. <clears throat> the first one, uh, like Fest, uh, was a, a biography, a biographical essay on Hitler himself. It's not a biographical dictionary, okay? I try and write essays in a fluent way and the, 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 different, uh, the different levels. So that was Hitler. And uh, I, God help me, I went through all his speeches, all his writings, all the documentation I could find. Uh, and one of my tutors was Martin Gilbert, who was at Oxford, who was what the, uh, became the official biographer of Churchill. Uh, I, uh, I was his last undergraduate pupil, not, not because I was so unbearable that he gave up after that, but uh, actually because he was appointed Churchill's biographer just towards the end of my stint with him. Uh, and he was a man who believed, in a way that I normally don't share, he believed that you, what you do is you go back to the sources. You don't bother about what historians have said. Uh, but that's what I did with Hitler. Uh, and then there's a second level that I call the Paladins, and those are top people in the Nazi regime, Goering, Goebbels, Himmler, and so on. Uh, and there uh, I, I try and uh, present them in a new and different way. Then there's a third level who are the sort of instruments, people who weren't, weren't so important in shaping policy, but certainly very important in carrying it out. Eichmann, Heydrich, and people like that. And finally, at a lower level, what you might call ordinary mass murderers, sympathizers, supporters of one sort and another. Uh, so those are the four different levels. Uh, and what links them? Well, I think <coughs> what came through to me was the huge uh, importance of the First World War as a kind of national trauma, or at least uh, a trauma for the German middle classes, because it's very striking that none of these people I deal with actually came from the working class. There were no ex-communists and no ex-socialists. They all came from the nationalist, co comfortable, conservative German middle classes. And following that, quite a lot of them had surprising accomplishments that you think of as natural to the German middle classes. So several played the piano. I mean, to my astonishment, uh, I learned that uh, Ernst Röhm, who's the head of the Nazi stormtroopers, and who presented himself as a kind of rough, tough soldier type, he was actually quite a fine amateur pianist. Reinhard Heydrich was a very good uh, violinist. Adolf Eichmann played in a string quartet in exile in Argentina, and, and, and so on. Uh, what I wanted to argue was that a lot of them then suffered a personal or political or social uh, 
trauma at the end of World War I or even earlier than World War I. Uh, they'd all come down in the world and Hitler offered them and indeed the Germans more generally the opportunity to rebuild themselves and remake themselves and uh, get back on the kind of upward trajectory they'd been before the catastrophes that hit them. So uh, that was uh, uh, an important argument for me, I think, and an important discovery. So uh, I think I will probably stop there. Is that mm. all right? Feel free to carry on if you'd like, or if not, uh, no, if you're, you you're, you're too polite. I don't want to bore people. With, <laughs> so I'll, I'll sit down. But thank you very much for listening. Uh, and I will sit down and you can ask some awkward questions. Perfect. Um. Oh. Oh. So I just had one or two questions myself before we open up to the audience. I thought you might. Um, so, <laughs> so obviously you mentioned uh, you were the expert witness in the David Irving case and about Hitler's speeches. Um, I was listening to a podcast last week uh, and it said that over a million people on TikTok had actually listened to one of Hitler's speeches translated into English um, and it had hundreds of thousands of likes. Um, I was curious in the wake of that and also sort of a rising age of misinformation given artificial intelligence, you know, sort mm. of misinformation on Twitter and X, um, what can we as historians, um, what role should we play in protecting truth and objectivity um, <laughs> in sort of, right. yeah, in this world of misinformation? Well, of course, one of the reasons why I wrote this book, which I haven't mentioned yet, is the rise of the strong man in the present the dangers and threats to democracy, including in the United States, uh, and the disregard for truth and objectivity, which is a hallmark of the Nazis. Uh, Josef Goebbels, the Nazi propaganda chief, was a, an absolutely ruthless, conscienceless liar and, and, and fantasist. And also, um, the leading Nazis do appear to have believed in one huge conspiracy theory. They were not on the whole conspiracy theorists, unlike, say, Stalin, who was always arresting and executing people for imagined conspiracies against him. But of course, Hitler had come into politics right at the beginning of the 20s, and all the people who were his subordinates began and carried on as admirers and followers. Whereas Stalin came out of a, a generation of Bolsheviks, of communists in Russia, who, many of whom were more prominent and better known than, than he was. So um, Stalin developed all these conspiracy theories and argued absurdly that they'd all been working for the capitalist West you know, since the beginning. The one big conspiracy theory that Hitler espoused, and with him, partly under his influence, partly on their own, his followers believed in the vast conspiracy theory of anti-Semitism. It's important to understand this because their belief was that Jews all over the world, and they meant here Jews by race, not by religion. So in a, in a sense, if you were a Jew who became a Christian, you were even more dangerous than, than otherwise because you you know more difficult to tell who you were. Uh, and they were by their nature, by heredity, by their essence, subversive, dangerous, and uh, working towards the destruction of Western and particularly German civilization everywhere, all of them, even if they didn't know it themselves, even if it was unconscious. Uh, and so that is what Hitler believed in. And of course, that kind of narrowed down to the belief that the Jews had caused Germany's defeat in World War I, this great national trauma, because they had fomented uh, discontent in the army and, and on the home front uh, and stabbed the army in the back. And the truth, of course, was that the army was defeated militarily on the Western Front in particular, but also uh, on the Southeastern Front as well. But that was, the, that was the Nazi belief. So all Jews everywhere had to be killed. Oh, sorry, I forgot the second part of your question. <laughs> um, how, what do we do? How do we do, deal with these conspiracy theories which are now proliferating everywhere, <coughs> all over the place. Um, and there is, of course, the QAnon conspiracy theory, which is a new version of traditional anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, and even medieval ones. You know, the blood libel where <coughs> Jews are alleged in the Middle Ages to be 
capturing Christian boys and drinking their blood for some ritual purpose, and you find that uh, is resurfaced in the QAnon conspiracy theory um, in various ways. What can we do? Well, uh, there are various things that can be done and should be done, and it's very regrettable that uh, Elon Musk has pulled Twitter out of a lot of the controls and monitoring uh, that, that it originally was doing. And so it's allowing absurd conspiracy th and dangerous conspiracy theories to proliferate. One of the things the internet does is to bypass traditional gatekeepers of opinion, newspaper, magazine editors, uh, TV and radio producers and so on. Uh, and it's, it's out of control. So there needs to be more, more uh, monitoring and, and, and so on. And what can we do as historians? Well, we can, first of all, argue, and I did this in a book I published a long time ago in the 90, late 90s called In Defense of History, and we can argue that you can achieve, uh, you can approach the truth in history. It's not all invented. Uh, there are ways of establishing what is the truth about history. You can still argue about it, of course, but actually the facts um, are, can be pretty well established. We did that in the Irving trial. Uh, we established, I think, that <clears throat> even when the Holocaust survivors are no longer with us, historians can be relied upon to establish the factual evidence for uh, the, the uh, Nazi-inspired killing of six million Jews during World War II. So we can do that, and we can insist on um, we can insist on the um, the truth, and to a degree, on objectivity. And objectivity, to my mind, is um, recognizing the limits imposed on us by the evidence. Uh, you know, if you can say you can argue about the origins of World War One, oh, it was the Russians' fault, oh, it was the Germans' fault, and so on. What you can't argue is, uh, is that it's the fault of little, men, little green men who came down to Earth in a spaceship. Uh, there are limits to what you can actually say in the past, and I think we need to insist on that. Um, but I, you know, I can't claim that we can solve the problem of truth and objectivity on our own. It needs a much, much wider effort. As historians, that's what we can. That's our limited contribution. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so the next thing I wanted to talk to you about was sort of ahistorical depictions of the Holocaust. So recently uh, you tweeted um, sort of in support of the fact that children shouldn't necessarily be exposed um, to the uh, production of uh, the Tattooist of Auschwitz. Um, I say sort of when I was younger, um, I think my first introduction to the Holocaust was a boy in the striped pyjamas. So I just wondered if you could sort of, sort of talk to us a bit more about sort of your opinion on sort of these ahistorical uh, fictions about so, sort of such an important historical event. Um, and how you think they should be, you know, better depicted in fiction. Yeah. I like it when you say when you were young. I mean, from my <laughs> perspective. <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> yeah. Well, uh, there's a, a lot of... Uh, well, let me say, people like to have hope. And so in quite a few uh, movies about the Holocaust, the accent is, is on hope, is on how people can be, you know, can become positive about it and so on, um, in some way. So Schindler's List is a classic example, a movie made by Steven Spielberg, which is about a German, a corrupt German businessman who rescued a, a, a number of Jews by employing them ostensibly for the Nazis. Um, <clears throat> uh, but <clears throat> he drew up a list of these Jews to employ, but as my friend Richard Overy said in a very sharp review of the film and the book it was based on, uh, Hitler's list was a lot longer. And I think our desire to escape the grim uh, implications of uh, the Nazi extermination of the Jews uh, is one that has to be resisted, I, I, I think. We need to recognize how terrible uh, and awful it was. Uh, and of course it was, again, Nazi anti-Semitism is different from, say, Nazi anti-Slavism, because for the Nazis, the Slavs were subhumans. Um, the Jews, however, on the, you know, the Nazis had a plan, the general plan for the East, which envisaged up to 45 million Slavs, as they called them, being exterminated within the next 20 years or so, had they won. The Jews were a global threat. 
So absolutely everywhere where they had to, where they were encountered, they had to be exterminated. And that is really very different from other kinds of um, exterminism or genocide, if you want to use that, that word. Yeah, but um, now I've again forgotten the second half of your question. Um, sort of, what do you think the sort of, uh, just explore more about the, the dangers? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, the sort of... Boy of the Striped Pajamas is, is, is not convincing because it would never have happened. A, a young, uh, young German uh, outside a concentration or extermination camp, uh, he would have been a member of the Hitler Youth. He would have been as anti-Semitic as any of the others and from a very young age. And that's a kind of distortion which I think springs from this need for, for hope and, and the need to feel optimistic about it. Uh, more grim, I think, is um, The uh, Zone of Interest, which I think is a fine film, but it's rather different from Martin Amis's book. And I actually helped Martin Amis with the book. He, he, I, I knew him already through some other event, and he sent it to me, the manuscript for corrections. I found about 50 mistakes. I think it's a mor morally very problematic book. Uh, and the film, I think, negotiates the moral uh, dilemmas uh, of, the, of the book in a better way than the book itself does. But uh, it's... Um, you have to be very careful when dealing with this subject not to distort uh, perspectives in order to give readers or viewers some kind of optimism or hope which the subject doesn't really allow. Thank you, that's very insightful. I think now we'll turn to uh, questions from the audience. Um, so uh, if you'd like to sort of ask a question, raise your hand. Have you got a roving um, mic? Uh, what's that? Got a roving mic. Uh, do we have a roving mic? No, no <laughs> roving mic. So you just need to speak up. Uh, Shout. And if yeah. so, I can repeat the question. Okay, uh, I can see a hand just there at the back. There we go. Oh, yeah, yeah, you. Oh, next to Lee. Yeah, Ed. Yeah, no reason. Hi, uh, thanks very much for your talk. You'll have to repeat this to me. No reason. <laughs> okay, sorry, I'll, I'll try harder. Um, as, as you say, you're, you're history and you're interested in history starting with the the Second World War and with German history starting from that point. And what can be often problematic with modern German history, particularly focusing on the Second World War and on Hitler, is that it goes back in time and it approaches German history in the long view with kind of that as the end point. And you can always often present World War II as if it was to some extent inevitable or as if there was some kind of ingrained cultural explanation. Uh, you mentioned Hans Ulrich Weyler, for example, in his long debate, which can tend to always that. And uh, I think to some extent the stories like Orlando Fiji is make a similar kind of fallacy when looking at the Russian Revolution, for example. Um, so how, as a historian studying primarily uh, the period of World War II and Hitler and the Holocaust, as you talked about, do you approach history in a longer view that doesn't kind of predetermine that outcome and doesn't kind of narrow the focus just on that as, as a way into Germany? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, uh, uh, that's, OK, I'll yeah, yeah. follow that. I'll pay perfect, um, no. <clears throat> You can... Um, when you're arguing about the origins or causes of something, it's very difficult to, to avoid giving the impression that whatever you're, argue, whatever you're writing about is inevitable, right? Um, so I think you always have to point out the chances and, and chance circumstances that intervened at many different stages. Um, during and immediately after the war for some time, the Nazi phenomenon used to be seen as the inevitable culmination of German history. And there were books that went back to and argued that uh, to uh, Luther to Hitler kind of thing. You know, the Germans are pre-programmed to become uh, Nazis. And the point about, the problem with that is that <coughs> um, they're, 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 they're kind of selective, so they just pick out things in the past that look as if they were going to lead to the Nazis, and they lead everything else out. And even in the 90s, the 1990s, uh, uh, Goldhagen, the so-called Goldhagen debate, argued that being anti-Semitic, murderously, exterminatory anti-Semitism was hardwired into the very notion of being German. And your problem there is that, uh, first of all, the most, most of the Nazis ever got in a free election, a free national election, was 37.4%. So nearly two-thirds of Germans voted against the Nazis. In fact, in the November 1932 elections, the last free elections of the Weimar uh, Republic, the Communists and the Socialists together got more votes than the Nazis did. And the Communists and the Socialists were not anti-Semitic. Uh, so 
that is a, that's a real problem. And then you kind of reverts to history and you have to start explaining how and why it was that the Nazis came to power in historical terms, not in the uh, kind of, by some kind of innate desire of the Germans to have a strong leader, which is just really, uh, you can understand people saying that during the war, but not, not now. I think it's all very different. And we've tended to now, rather than trace back Nazism and its ideology into German history, we've tended to look at broader influences. Gobineau, the French uh, racial theorist, for example, of the 19th century. Um, we've looked at English, British social Darwinism, a version of which was espoused by Hitler. There are multiple different origins and different influences on Nazism. The synthesis of Nazism was unique, but the bits that it put together were not, and they weren't just German. Uh, and <clears throat> we, I had a long, I mean, I became a great friends with this historian, Hans Ulrich Wehler, but uh, because we were kind of like sparring partners, you know, uh, and he always saw the long-term origins of Nazism in, in German history, and he saw the Kaiserreich, the emperors, the Kaisers Germany as a kind of anti-chamber to the Third Reich. And similar arguments have been raging about the Weimar Republic. I've just written a review of a book about the Weimar Republic. It should be out in the Times Literary Supplement in the next couple of weeks, maybe. Um, and historians have valiantly tried to rescue the Weimar Republic as a, a period of achievement to be celebrated and not just uh, a litany of failure to be blamed for the rise of Nazism. So these arguments continue. We cannot possibly, of course, look at um, the, the past without knowing what happened afterwards. And so, well, we can't erase the memory of what happened between 1933 and 45 from, uh, from our accounts of the years of 1918 to 1933, still less from 1871 to 1918. But we can uh, try and get a more balanced view, I think, than simply regarding it all as the antechamber of the Third Reich. Thank you. Uh, another question? Uh, we'll just go uh, just there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, just. yeah, yeah. Hi, yeah. Oh, you got a mic, look. Fantastic. I need a front, though, so. Have you switched it on? Is it? Okay, I suppose. <laughs> anyway, um, this question has a little to do yes. with Katja Hoyer, who I saw in London last month at Fashion Liberal Club, and she mentioned being cancelled, quote unquote, for. Um, interviewing East German border guards, East German guards on the Berlin Wall in yeah. her latest book, Beyond the Wall. And to my impression, it's already become possible, as it were, to write from the perspective of Nazi soldiers or those who are military involved in the regime. I'm thinking above all of Zonka Neitzel in Soldaten and also latterly now in Deutsche Krieger, which, if you're a sparring partner of Hans Ulrich Wiel, I don't know how you feel about Zonka Neitzel, but... Um, I suppose I was just wondering when you think it might be possible to write from the perspective of East German soldiers or those militarily yeah. involved in the regime in the same way that we can now do for the yeah, Nazis? Yeah. Well, Is absolutely. it just a matter of time? Yeah. Or, yeah. Absolutely. So history is about, among other things, that it's about to try and un it's about the attempt to understand other people who are separated from us, first of all, by time. And you know the famous opening to L.P. Hartley's the novel, The Go-Between, the past is another country, they do things differently there. And we have to try and bridge the gap and not assume that people in the past were just like us. And then, of course, you, the, it, when you're dealing with another country, as I've dealt <clears throat> through my life with uh, Germany, you've got that double distancing factor. And the historical imagination is what's absolutely crucial for bridging, bridging that gap. And that's why history is not about moral judgment. It's about understanding and interpreting. It's not about condemning the past. And it always annoys me when politicians say, history will judge me. Well, it doesn't actually. History doesn't judge anybody. It just tries to explain what people have been doing. And you can m make this massive effort to try and understand them, as it were, in their own terms. Uh, and that, of course, clashes then by 
because we have a different perspective on, on what they were doing. And it's one of the great intellectual challenges. Thank you. Uh, another question? Yeah, just here at the front again. Uh, yep, you, you, I you, mean, yeah. no, we have a massive amount of evidence. You know, we've got... Uh, trying to understand the Nazis, we have huge <coughs> amounts of their writings, descriptions of what they did, their interrogations and post-war trials, all of those kinds of things. We've got a massive amount of information which we can use to try and understand them. Yeah. And it's not true... Uh, to say, as a French historian did notoriously, to understand everything is to excuse everything. I mean, that's not true at all. Yeah? Forgive me if you've answered this question in the third book of your trilogy. I've only reached the second so far. Um, I got the impression from reading um, Tuzi's Wages of Destruction that the Nazi... Uh, obsession with genocide to not only the Jews but the Poles, the Ukrainians, Belarusians, the Slavs made them rather inefficient conquerors. <coughs> Would you agree? Well, okay. The, I mean, first of all, the different kinds of levels of genocide. So, as I said, the general plan for the East envisaged uh, genocide on an almost unimaginable scale of killing 45 million or allowing to die 45 million so-called Slavs just because they were Slavs, um, the, the genocide of the Jews is something rather different because they were regarded as a massive threat. You know, it's one of, there's a wonderful Warsaw Ghetto joke, and there are such things, um, which uh, from the Warsaw Ghetto, you know, they, an elderly Jew comes onto a tram and he sees his friend reading the Nazi paper, the Volkischer Beobachter, the racial observer, uh, and, and so, you know, they're, they're living in absolute miserable poverty, starvation, beatings, and so on. And he says to his friend, why are you reading a Nazi paper, for God's sake? Why, you know, why are you doing that? And his friend looks at it and just says, well, once every week I buy this paper to see uh, how we are, we Jews are ruling the world. We are in, the, in charge of everything, you know, and that's why. So um, it's, it's a different order of things, and you find that in the behaviour of... German soldiers, as well as the SS, there's a desire there to humiliate, humiliate the Jews they come across, not just to kill them. So, mm. so there are there are differences there. Uh, I think. Have I not? Answered? I don't think I, I've got a feeling I haven't answered your question. What was the last bit of it? Uh, did that make them inefficient no. conquerors? Sorry. Did that make them inefficient conquerors of land? Yeah. Well, there was an argument. There were arguments. Yes, it did. I mean, because. There is an argument. Hans Rose, um, Hans, um, Alfred Rosenberg, who was the uh, ideologue of Nazism, a great anti-Semite, but he was made minister for the occupied Eastern territories. And of course, if you think about Ukrainians, Belarusians, people who lived in the west of Russia, and so on, uh, they had been um, under Stalin's iron rule for years. And so when the Germans invaded in 1941, they, people from villages came towards them and, and, and offering them the traditional bread and salt and uh, they were ripe for conversion, as it were, for making, making them into useful assistants and, and aid to the Nazis. And Hitler was having none of this. He just said, they're, they're <laughs> subhumans, they are to be cleared out of the way. And there were quite a lot of arguments within this, which have naturally, of course, Hitler won, and these people were exterminated in large numbers. So, uh, and very, in a very short space of <coughs> time, uh, the Nazis began to, after the June, June the 22nd, 1941, the invasion of the Soviet Union, the Nazis ran into increasing amounts of partisan activity who were, uh, the partisans were cutting off their lines of supply, shooting and blowing up people. They didn't have a choice. If they didn't resist, they would be shot anyway. Uh, so it was a very counterproductive policy in the longer run. The partisans became more and more important towards the end of the war. Thank you. Uh, How we go. Uh, yep. Someone at the back there. Uh, right at the back, on the right. Okay, yep. Thanks. Uh, thank you. 
Um, my question is on your analysis of Nazism as a phenomenon that preponderantly happened among um, the middle class. Um, my question is, to what extent would you say that this is influenced by, and it's different to an analysis of Nazism, more influenced by Marxism? Uh, well, I didn't quite understand that. Sorry. Um, yeah, sorry. No, so I was just curious. I would like to um, know more uh, of. You say that there is a crucial class element in Nazis and that most of their leaders come from one specific class. Um, I guess in general, it would be interesting to hear how is it that this understanding of class is still different from the understanding of class given by how Marxists uh, analyze the phenomena of Nazism. So what was the question? Um, I, I think the difference of uh, sort of your understanding of class and why sort of, you know, sort of Nazis uh, were dominated by the middle class, how is that different to Marxist theory of class? Was that? Well, you can't, unfortunately, you can't explain uh, Nazism in, in Marxist terms at all. Um, it used to be thought, for example, it was um, a creation of capitalism and particularly big business in, in, in a terrible crisis in the Depression. But it turns out not to be the case at all. Big business in Germany did not support the Nazis until they had come into power and until the 5th of March elections. Otherwise, big business hedged its bets uh, and supported various, policies, various parties on the right, uh, some of them to absolutely no effect whatsoever. It just happens to be the case that uh, these, all these people I look at in this book were, came from solid middle class conservative nationalist political parties. Now, it doesn't mean to say there were no working class people in the Nazi movement, of course. Uh, similarly, unemployment. Now, the party of the unemployed was the Communist Party, which kept on growing even when the Nazis began to decline in November 1932. Um, but uh, Nazism was a kind of, it's been called a catch-all party of protest. And the, uh, the you know, it's more than 50, it's a huge, it's like 35% unemployed and probably a lot more than that because of women, women tended not to register as unemployed when they lost their jobs in the Depression. Uh, but it's a huge, uh, massive unemployed. <coughs> unemployed. So, um, of course, quite a few Nazis were unemployed and also came from the uh, unorganized working class. So working class who were not part of a trade union movement or the socialist movement. Um, what's crucial is the, the impact of ideology. And you have to look uh, for ideology, not as the expression of class interests, but, but as, uh, as a force in its own right. Thank you. Uh, we'll go uh, just out the front. Yep, yep, yeah, uh, so I believe it's your opinion that the Nazi maintenance of power is primarily down to coercion and consent following the dark era of World War I and the failure of Weimar. However, I was just wondering on your opinion on how much terror plays as a factor of uh, maintenance of power and how you can measure terror as a factor and its effect over the German population. Yes, uh, interesting question. So. Um, it was argued about 20 years ago now by historians like Gert Sarli and Eric Johnson um, and uh, uh, Robert Gillespie that the Nazis did not need coercion or threat or intimidation or violence to come to power. And that's simply, I'm afraid, not brought out by the evidence. Um, it's, uh, you know, th there was... In 1924, when uh, Hitler's beer hall putsch, the attempt to seize power by force, had failed miserably in Bavaria. Uh, it some, was sometimes argued that after that he turned to uh, the peaceful conquest of power through the ballot box, right, through, and that did certainly become more important to him. Though it was not until the depression struck that he got any kind of mass support. But that was a parallel to continued and expanding and deepening violence against his enemies. So you've got the violence on the streets and then you have propaganda campaigns of the ballot box in, in elections. In the elections, the national elections, free elections of uh, the summer of 1932, 
Over 400 people were killed on the streets. I mean, that's an extraordinary phenomenon, uh, unparalleled in, you know, in modern elections, I think. So that's always an important part. And coercion and intimidation were, uh, were a massive uh, weapon in the hands of the Nazis. And then you've got um, control. So uh, this is not a total totalitarian society in which nobody has freedom of manoeuvre of any kind. But on the other hand, you have to look at all national institutions down to all, all institutions, uh, you know, football clubs, choirs, all of that sort of stuff, they were all uh, subsumed into the Nazi organization. School students, it, it, if this had been 1935 in Germany, you'd all have been wearing uniforms and you'd be, all be in the Hitler Youth or some, or the SA or some equivalent organization. Um, it was a very coercive, controlling regime. And that's what means for democracy to be destroyed. There's no independent police, there's no independent politicians, there's no independent press or radio. It's all part of the Nazi machine, and that was a very important part of it, I think. Uh, so, uh, and, and it's a kind of a twin track approach. So, propaganda, brilliantly organized by Josef Goebbels, was directed at trying to win people over. He gave a speech. Uh, after the elections of March the 5th, 1933, which gave the Nazis and their uh, allies, the nationalists, conservative nationalists, 52% of the, of the vote, under conditions where other political parties were not allowed to campaign at all. And Goebbels said, uh, well, this is great, but you've got 48% of the electors have not supported us and we must make sure that we can win them over. We cannot, he's quite open about it, we cannot just bludgeon them into silence. We have to get their support. And that's a characteristic of totalitarian movements, of, as they're called, um, with reservations, you know, of but dictatorships, let's say, of the 1930s, that they were modern. In a trend started by Louis Napoleon, Napoleon III in France in the mid 19th century, but it wasn't just enough to suppress uh, opposition. You needed to generate at least the appearance of popular support as well as a form of legitimacy for your rule. So that's why Hitler, for example, allowed, uh, for, allowed elections to continue, including votes for women, although this is one of the most male chauvinist regimes it's ever been. But women voted. You didn't have any choice. You just voted for Hitler and the Nazis or... Uh, you ran the risk of being arrested if you spoiled your ballot paper. Uh, there was no one else you could vote for. Um, <clears throat> and so Hitler could go to international, international politics and tell other countries, look, I've got support of 99% of my electorate. They're all backing me in, in this. I think there's time for one or two more questions. Um, so go just there. Yeah, uh, yeah just you here. Right, have you got a mic there? <laughs> right, here you go. I've got a mic anyways, it's fine. Turning to the present again and especially... Can you speak up, please? <laughs> turning to the present again and especially to present day Germany and the political situation there, how would you or how do you think one could um, explain the rise of the far, far right party in Germany at the moment, the AFD? And would you locate this rise within the global movements of far-right populist movements, or do you see something specifically, uniquely German about this? Okay, so the AFD, yeah, the yeah, alternative the for Germany, as it's called. Um, well, first of all, um, it's very important to understand about the Nazis, that they were an aggressive, um, uh, militaristic movement that... Uh, you know, that wanted to establish a, a massive, a world empire, indeed. Um, just like Mussolini, wanted, the Italian fascists, who, uh, on whom they were partly modelled, wanted to establish a Mediterranean empire. Uh, by, and all of this is done by invading other countries and getting a huge army and so on. Now, the last time I looked, the AFD did not want to invade Poland. Uh, they are, in many ways, a standard <clears throat> European far-right political party, which is focused above all on 
immigration. It's an anti-immigrant party, uh, just the same as Georgia Maloney and her government in Italy are anti-immigrant. So, uh, of course, the AFD are making arguments, they're a nationalist party as well, so they're arguing, of course, that Germans should no longer be uh, afraid of, of, you know, should, should, should Germans should no longer uh, put consciousness and responsibility for the Holocaust and for the Nazi period at the center of their beliefs. And that, you know, you go to Berlin and there's a monument to the victims of Nazism at the center of it. And um, the AFD would want to move, move beyond that as a far right party, but that's not what really motivates them. It's anti-immigrant the, and also because they're, uh, they're much more popular in the former East Germany than they are in the former West Germany, because East Germany was never, as we were, educated <clears throat> by the communist regime into uh, accepting responsibility for the Holocaust. They were taught to identify with the Communist Party, which, whose role in resisting Nazism was hugely inflated by East German uh, uh, ideology. So, um, and East Germany, the former East Germany, is still suffering from serious economic deprivation uh, and which has not really been overcome. So there are many reasons for East German discontent driving them towards the AFD. So I don't, I don't, I don't see the parallels with Nazism as being terribly strong. Okay, I think that's time. This is also why Donald Trump, in my view, I know it's controversial, but in my view he's not a fascist because at the center of fascism is militarism and the desire to invade other countries and establish an empire, and, and Trump is an isolationist who wants to withdraw America from the rest of the world, leave NATO, and so on. I think there's time for probably one more question, um, so we can kind of keep it brief. Uh, we'll just go uh, at the back, <coughs> in the middle, in the middle of the... Um, I just want to touch on something you were saying earlier about both counterfactuals and personalities. How do you think the German far right would have looked without Adolf Hitler? And is there anyone in your book of his underlings that Nazism might have taken a fundamentally different course or been removed from power, for example, had they not existed? Uh, no. So Hitler had absolute control and, and, you know, over the Nazi movement from the very beginning. That's why, as I said, he was loyal to his subordinates and they were loyal to him. The only real alternative to Nazism in 1932 to 33 was a military dictatorship by the army, who certainly, although they were restricted to 100,000 men, they were certainly very well trained and, and well equipped within the terms of the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, and that was certainly threatened by <coughs> General Schleicher um, to take over. Their aims, the army's, the military's aims and ideology overlapped quite a lot with that of the Nazis. Um, but had the, um, had the ultra-conservative forces around President Hindenburg who uh, wanted to destroy the Weimar Republic and whose aim was to co-opt the Nazis to, to give themselves some kind of legitimacy by having a mass movement behind them, uh, you know, had, had those people actually staged a military coup, uh, well, there would have been a lot of violence because I think the stormtroopers would have, uh, would have run riot. Um, but had they seized power, then I, you know, there would have been anti-Semitic um, measures, but they would not have resulted, I think, in the Holocaust. And you find a lot of, uh, a lot of um, uh, generals, one of whom I have a chapter on in the book, uh, shared a lot of anti-Semitic beliefs, but did not support the SS and its exterminatory drive. Uh, and the, uh, there would have been a Second World War because they were keen to reverse the first. But it would have been different, I think. Thank you very much. Well, um, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, before we sort of wrap things up, there's just a few notices uh, I'd like to run over. Um, so tomorrow is the last day of our open period, uh, and that will be a debate. Uh, this house would make vaccinations mandatory. It's also the last day of our discount uh, for life membership. Um, so that's £250 for life. We also have access memberships and scholarships available. Um, after this event, there will be a book signing. So if you just allow us yep. to um, head down to the back uh, and get everything set up. So feel free to come along, uh, buy a copy of Sir Richard Evans' new book and get that signed. But otherwise, thank you very much for joining okay. us today. Thank you. Um, I hope everyone's enjoyed it.